OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. Hello, good morning, everyone. Welcome back from break. My name is Arturo Ambriz. I'm an education program consultant here at the CDE Adult Education Office. I'll be covering today the, the WIOA Title II Fiscal Compliance Overview. And I'll be referring to it on our presentation as AFLA, which uh, stands for Adult Education and Family Literacy Act. And sometimes I'll refer to it as we are title to. Uh, I'd like to mention one more thing before I start is that this presentation will end around, around noon and then we'll have an hour lunch and we'll come back up one for the data and accountability requirements, uh, which will be presented by Dr. Amukela Webb. So you definitely wanna be back on time. I also <laughs> wanna mention that I hope everyone is at that speed after going to Jay uh, presentation. But again, I it's it's hard to compete with that. So just hang in there. Thank you. Okay. The overview topics that we'll be covering today, we will go over the statute and regulations that apply to this AFLA grant. We cover timely spend funds and carryover, which is basically the the parameters of this grant, which that the agency has to spend the funds. We we'll go over the supplement, NASA plan provisions, which is the provisions that AFLA funds are supplemental to your state and local funds for adult education, mainly for UK funding cost allowability and allocation requirements. That's the rules and regulations for allowable cost and how much can you charge to the program in proportions to the benefit received. We cover also the standards for documentation of personal expenses, which is also refers to time and effort records, re reporting requirements. These are your semi-annual certifications, personal activity reports, or parts, timesheets, the documentation the agency uses to document salaries and wages, the, the time that the employees spend working on those federal programs. We also cover matching requirements really quick at the end. That is the 25% requirement match that the agencies have um, report of the agency reported in the year on the expenditure claim reports. So with that, uh, we know and understand that payroll compliance can be complex, but as administrators, you will need to be familiar with these requirements. And sometimes you might not be involved on all the functions of these areas, but it's very important to, that you know who is doing that work. And, and that being said, in spite of your level of experience on fiscal, whether you have a lot or, or not so much, if anything, please keep a copy of this presentation handy, perhaps on your desktop, and share with other program and fiscal staff that who is involved in the process. Finally, for questions, if you have any questions as we go through each of these areas, please write those on the chat as, as, we pre as the presentation go on. And my colleague, Jim, will read those at the end of each er this area. And I'll, I'll, I'll respond to those. If for some reason I don't know the answer or it requires follow-up, We'll keep in the Q and A, and I'll be I'll be sure to respond. Excuse me. <laughs> okay, let's start with statute and regulation. For re this is for reference, the statute is mainly the law that applies to this grant, and includes such things such as 
the provisions for Section 231 that Dr. Sakari mentioned yesterday, the provisions for supplement as a plan. The regulations is mainly EDGAR, which stands for Education Department and General Administration Re Regulations. These are the rules that apply to all federal grants issued by the uh, US Department of Education. Then back in 2015, 16, the uniform grade guidance, they combined all the circulars and became one, one requirements for all federal awards issued by the federal government. So Edgar incorporated the uniform grant guidance, wow. which is gonna be referred as uh, part 200 or to CFR 200. So again, recipients of AFLA funds must comply with these requirements. So again, as administrators, you will need to be familiar with this and refer to, the, to this when you are planning to spend funds, when you are developing your budgets. And, and this is definitely uh, one of those areas that is a collaboration between fiscal and program because program knows the needs of uh, the, 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 the programmatic part and fiscal knows the internal controls and, the, and these requirements. Some of the slides, they have underlying references. So what that is, is basically a direct link to, the, to that reference. And lastly, I like to mention that there are also other regulations such as uh, Title 34 that might apply to AFLA, but these two are the main ones that directly applies to the fiscal compliance. This is just a summary for references. This is what you have been learning throughout this new administrative orientation. And this is just basically a summary of how APLA funds are awarded by section, resource code, and the fiscal area of, of, of the fiscal area we're overviewing. So for instance, section 231 has two resource code, resource code 3905, which the program areas that can use those funds are AVE, adult basic education, ELA, English Language Acquisition, and EL Civics. And we also have resource code 39113 under section 231. And those funds are intended for adult secondary education with, in California is high school equivalency, GED or high set, and high school diploma. We also have section 225 and 243 and so the 243 agencies is those funds are intended to support English language learners co-enroll on a compliance IELC with, with or without IET. Literacy and workforce preparation activities. My colleague Corey will, he's a, the subject expert for this program. So he'll be going over it uh, today on everything you need to know about Section 243 for those agencies that receive this funding. And this is the first, the first actual area that we're covering today and is timely spending funds and carryover. So AFLA funds cannot be carried over from one fiscal year to the next they must be expended or financially obligated by June 30th. Funds are considered expended as of the day of the obligation consisting with Title 34, 76, Section 76707. So this reference will take you to, uh, it's a table that includes examples of services, materials, property, and it will tell you the date that they obligate. For instance, I have a couple of examples that will help us understand the cons this requirement. 
salaries and benefits, they obligate when the services are performed, which means that you can only report those up to June 30th. Comparing to, for example, computer devices, they obligate when the agency makes that written commitment. So in many situations you will, for example, want to order computers or laptops in May or April, but they will not be available until July or September. So the, the funds are considered obligated when you made that written commitment on May or April, and you can claim those as part of that fiscal year, even though the, the devices will be received after June 30th. So and the planning and collaboration, especially for uh, new grantees that this is different from other federal funds, might be different for all, all other federal funds that allow carryover. Planning and collaboration with both fiscal and program to spend or obligate these funds is especially important. So the window is July 1st to June 30th of the fiscal year. Financial obligation is basically the, the definition on the regulation is, is defined as orders placed for property, services, contracts, and similar transactions, transactions that require payment. The, the written commitment documentation that you will need if you have that situation that you will purchase something in May, but or April or June that will be received after June 30th, the agency will need to maintain documentation such as a purchase order, signed contract, a specific description and cost of the item that you order. And that's pretty much for timely spending funds and carry over. Jim, do we have any questions so far? Not at this time, Arturo. Good. So again, if you don't think of any question as we go through. Oh, sorry, one just uh, popped up here. Okay, no problem. Yeah, just see. you can put those on or you can send them to me later or definitely reach out to your CD consultant. So, so, uh, so our first question, is it the same for contracts for services? That, each, yeah, it's, it's, it's the same, but again, each situation is different. So if the contract, for example, services depends on what it is, it really depends on what it is. So like, for example, if the services is is not you want to make a contract for a service like for example a, a professional development or presentation if the the person that's going to provide the, the the presentation is not available before the june 30th but you want that presentation you might be able to pay with that funding with that fiscal year contract contract we cover the that will be depending on the details of the contract. For example, if you contracted for something that it won't, is going to start July 1st and, and, and on, then that's the time period that the, the funds can be used. So it really is on the timing. And again, there are examples on that table. And if anything, please reach out to your CD consultant. And I, I think you may have just answered this, uh, but the fault was by when contract is signed or by when service is provided. It's, again, it, it will depend. So if the contract, like for example, if, if you have a, if you sign in a contract in July, but those services are going to start you, uh, I mean, let me just stand back. If that contract, depend on the services, but if the contract is signed in May or June, but the services will start from July on, then the obligation really, on this case, even though it happens on, on May, the, if the services belong to that fiscal year, 
then that's that's when you can uh, that's when they obligate you that will be July because like for example a lot of the time schools have subscriptions right to software programs you can use Alpha funds for whatever month those subscriptions uh, pertain to like for example if you pay for subscriptions on May 2023 or, or make a contract for those in May 2023, but those subscriptions are for are to begin July 1st, then you should really be using funds from the new fiscal year, from the, the fiscal year, the year that will start July 1st. Uh, I hope that answered that question. And it looks like we're all caught up now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Great. Okay, we move on to supplement as plan. And this is basically the provisions that federal funds must go are supplemental and must go on top or you stay on local funds. And on this case again is mainly K funding. So what is required? The requirements say that funds for adult education and literacy activities under this title shall supplement or increase the level of services and not supplant or replace the state or local funds expended for adult education and literacy activities. So in other words, AFLA funds should not be used to pay for services staff, programs, or materials that will otherwise be paid with state and local funds. A leading question that is useful when you consider spending AFLA funds is that to ask, what will have happened in the absence of AFLA funds? If the answer is that you can still support or pay for that service, equipment or not equipment, service or, or, or position or materials, you should continue using those funds. If the answer is no, you might be able to use APLA funds considering they comply with the uh, rules and regulations of the grant. For APLA, there are two presumptions of supplanting. And this is coming from, from the OMB compliance supplement, which is the federal compliance. So the first one is the agency, when the, the supplanting will be presumed if the agency use AFLA funds to provide services that the agency provided with no federal funds in the prior year. So again, in general, AFLA funds are supplemental. And the test is, is, is current to prior year. So the first question when preparing your budget or planning any cost with AFLA is to ask, how would you pay for this service in the prior year? Again, if you use stay and local funds, including CAPE, you should continue those using those resources. If this is a new cost or it's a supplemental service, a supplemental cost, you might use APLA funds. So on this on this first test, the, the assumption that from the feds is that if you use non-federal funds on the prior year, you should continue to use those funds. And throughout my presentation, I include notes which are question, but not necessarily, we don't require an answer on this uh, presentation, but it's, it's, help, it's to help you understand the requirement. The second test is that if the agency use AFLA funds to provide services that were required by law or regulation. And so the, again, the, the assumption is that if, you, if something is required by law, it should be funding allocated for that purpose and AFLA funds should not be used for that. That said, I'd like to mention that 
presumption of supplanted, supplanting are reviewable if the agency can demonstrate that it will not, they will not be able to offer those services or for the cost. Well, um, with no federal funds, have the federal funds not been available? And this reference here, the information on the supplemental also plan on the CD website, we have uh, frequently asked questions. I highly encourage you to visit that. It's basically, we will have the information that will that you'll need to know to comply with the supplemental supply requirements of this grant. And uh, I'll also like to say that the supplemental supply is a case by case basis. And definitely the specific details should be analyzed on each uh, on separate situation. Okay, uh, we have a couple of questions to practice our understanding of this concept of this provision. And this is our first question. If you notice, I included the answers for reference and for those who would like to go back later on and re re review those questions. But I, I feel that is also useful to understand the, the, the requirement and not be guessing which one do we say was the correct one or, or not. So uh, let's see the first one. So on this one, we have an agency that use state funds to pay for an adult basic ed education teaching position last year, but decided to use federal AFLA funds on the current year for the same teaching position because they receive additional funding. So the, the answer to this is that this will be a presumption of supplanting because the agency is replacing state with AFLA funds to pay for the same position. So in this case, it will be review or supplanting will be difficult. The only reason, the only way it will be may might be possible is if the position had extra responsibilities that are supplemental to the grant or it was something changed that will comply with the supplemental piece. And we have one more. This one include percentages. I, I just like to mention that I, percentages are not coming from the rules or regulations or statute. I'm just putting those to help us understand the, the requirement. And most of the time they're really basic percentages, 50, 25, 75. So, just letting you know that these are not coming from, from any regulations. So in this case, we have an agency that rents a copier to be used 50% on AFLA programs and 50% on non-AFLA programs. The agency pay 50% of the rent cost with AFLA and 50% we stay in local funds in the prior year but fully, fully pay, 100% pay with AFLA funds in the current year because the state and local funds resources were needed for other expenditures. And again, on this situation, supplanting will be presumed that the agency redirects state and local funds while using AFLA to fully pay for the cost. So on this scenario, the agency can only pay up to 50% of the copier cost with AFLA funds. And we'll, this will relate to a locability we will be covering in more detail in a minute. And that's pretty much it for supplement as a plan. Jim, do we have any questions for supplement as a plan? Uh, yes, yeah, so far there is one. And okay. uh, what about budget adjustments? If there are still funds in one category and we have an expense in another, what is the threshold to be able to spend the funds within another category? Or do we need to process a budget adjustment request? Okay, thank you, great question. So for AFLA, you can adjust your uh, budget within a resource code. 
for example, Resource Code 39, if you budget it for something on, on, on the 1000 object code uh, certificated personnel and you have funds available and there's a need to purchase devices or there's a need to pay someone classified so you can shift your costs within a resource code. You cannot transfer funds be between resource code. You can only but you shift your budget inside or within the, re the object codes in a resource code. I don't know if that makes sense. I hope that makes sense actually. <laughs> I, I believe it's okay. Uh, hold on here. Just got. Yeah, let's see if that's, okay. that is that respond. Yes, I I believe yes. Donna said thank okay. you. Uh, okay. Janice is asking, what if you discover a mistake? Great question, Janice. Thank you, Janice. So basically, that will if we if there's a mistake, like for example, and and I'm not sure what's the context to the question. Like for example. We go on and do a, a federal compliance review, and we notice that they pay these funds. They pay last year with K funds, and this year they showing that they pay with AFLA funds. So the first question a CDE reviewer will ask: What was the reason for the budget shift? And so, if it was an error, an error, they say, "Look, well, we didn't notice that we pay with K." And so we use AFLA. So if there's an error, then the agency will have to reimburse those funds to the CDE the year that they use AFLA funds, if there's a, a supplanting uh, violation. So I hope that, that answered the question. Yes, it, it did. Okay. And I, I think we're all caught up now, uh, Arturo, for questions. Okay, thank you. I think I went one. Oh, okay, we're moving on to a different area is cost allowability and allocation. This one has a lot of information and I'm, I'm really sorry for having so much information on some of, some of the slides. But on this specific one, I want to include all these factors because all these are to be considered when you're spending each cost. So definitely this one you will need to refer when you're planning to spend AFLA funds because all needs to be considered. I'll tell you that if, you, if the answer to the necessary, reasonable, and allocable is, is that you can support those three, the rest are pretty standard. So what is required to determine whether a cost is allowable or not is to be allowable on the federal awards, the cost must be necessary. With that means, can, can you demonstrate that there is a need? Can the agency demonstrate that there is a need? And again, program is the expert on this area. So that's why I mentioned collaboration between program and fiscal is crucial. The cost must be reasonable. So reasonable is typically on the procurement department, which a lot of the times is also fiscal. That's where the prudent person will pay based on the circumstances at the time the decision was made. Allocable is basically the cost charged to the program in proportion to the benefit received. Authorized is the requirement that it's it's not prohibited under AFLA, EDGAR, or the Uniform Guidance or State Local Fund. For example, sometimes something might be allowable under the under the, the, the factors affecting allowability, but if it's authorized on on this the law for certain uh, areas, then that will automatically make make it unallowable. Adequately documented. So that basically goes without saying. It's, it's that documentation that includes the 
the planning. It includes that you uh, purchase order, you uh, uh, evidence of approval, and again, the collaboration between fiscal and program. And last one, incurred during the approved budget period. Again, the window to spend or obligate the funds is between for this grant is between Ju July 1st and June 30th. So on the on the allocable, I'd like to mention one example that we'll be referring to it because it's a very important concept. So basically allocable is is the proportion the part that you pay in proportion of the benefit received. For instance, if you if you pay a teacher with 50% with AFLA funds and 50% with K funds or any other resources, the documentation, the time and effort documentation of that uh, teacher must reflect that the program, the AFLA program received 50% of the benefits. If you, another example, if you purchase a laptop with 100% AFLA funds, the expectation is that that computer or that laptop benefits 100% the AFLA program. And again, we'll be seeing more of that, but I just wanna mention because these factors are again, to be considered every time that expenditure is made with federal funds, including AFLA. On the D reference here, 420 to section 420 to section 4, 426, there are 56 general provisions and rules for selective items of cost, which include advertising alcoholic beverages, compensation of personal service services, which is salaries and benefits. So the there most of the time there you will see that these the the costs are allowable with restrictions. You you'll find those that are completely unallowable, like for example, uh, costs for alcoholic beverages. The list is an alphabetical order and is not a complete uh, list of allowable and unallowable costs as it relates to WIOA. I'd like to note here that even though a cost must be listed as allowable, it must also comply with the supplement as to plan provisions we discussed earlier and also meet those general cost principles noted on the prior slide. Is it necessary and reasonable, allocable, authorized, and adequately documented and incurred on the, on the approved budget? For instance, costs for travel and compensation for personal services are typically allowable with certain conditions and requirements. But if the agency pay for those costs, in the prior year with K funds, for example, then that makes this cost automatically unallowable for this agency. So again, if you have questions of any of these general uh, provisions, you can reach out to the CD consultant or you can reach out to me. Okay, and we have two questions, a couple of questions to understand the allowable, allowable cost and allocation. So in this case, we have, a, the question is, may AFLA funds be used to pay for the salary and related costs of an adult education teacher? And a lot of the times without knowing details, the answer will be, it depends. Generally, salary and related costs are allowable, but the costs are subject to restrictions and reporting requirements. So in this case, it will depend. Alpha funds might be used if or considering the teacher provides services to students who are eligible under, the, under Alpha. And 
the costs are necessary, reasonable, and all those requirements, and are and comply with the supplement as a plan provision. Okay. May AFLA funds be used to purchase office furniture such as desks, chairs, and cabinets? And in this case, the answer is no. AFLA funds cannot be used for office furniture. And in general, AFLA funds cannot be used for capital expenditures and equipment with the per unit acquisition cost equals or exceeding the agency's threshold capitalization threshold of $5,000. This is a state imposed requirement. And there is a few state imposed requirements such as no equipment over five, no expenditure, uh, capital expenditures over 5,000 per, per unit. The other one is no indirect costs are allowable to claim under this grant. Those state re imposed requirements are communicated to agencies on the request for applications. The RFAs that were just recently submitted for the 23-27 cycle. And this question includes the, I, I think will help us to understand the, the allocable proportion concept. So, in this case, we have an agency that rents a copier that is used 50% on AFLA programs and 50% on non-AFLA programs. So the question is, can the agency charge 50% of the cost to AFLA and 50% to non-AFLA programs? And the answer is yes. They, remember, the agency can charge up to the benefit received, which is in this case is 50%. On, on B, can the agency charge 75% of the cost to AFLA and 25 to non-AFLA? And on this case, it will be no. 75% is more than the 50% benefit received. So again, the agency can only change, charge up to 50% to AFLA. On C, can the agency charge 0% to AFLA and 100% to non-AFLA? And the answer is yes, charging zero to AFLA and receiving 50% of the benefits is acceptable. The feds will love this scenario. So again, in general, a lockable proportion concept is when two or more programs share costs plan ahead of the time. The cost must be charged to each program in proportion of the benefit received, or is solely pay, pay 100% with one funding source, the cost must benefit 100% such funding source. And that is pretty much for allowability and allocation. James, do we have any questions on the Q&A? Yes, we do have a, a couple. The first one, is it permissible to utilize the AFLA fund to compensate instructors for additional responsibilities, such as composing the monthly department newsletters? Okay, I, I like the question until the part that it says composing the monthly department newsletter. And again, that is possible if the additional responsibilities such as composing the monthly department newsletter, include AFLA programs. So you, I can see that as advertising costs. And again, it has to be for advertising, for advertising the AFLA programs, not the school. So that seems like potential. And definitely, we will ask for more details. If you reach out to CDE with that, then we'll, we'll need to know what kind of uh, information is on the newsletter and what other programs, because if you included AFLA programs and other programs, then you can we can do a, oh, the, the school will do a cost allocation and you can share that with CDE and then we say, yeah, that, that looks uh, adequate. 
but definitely the, what I like is the additional responsibilities. That's definitely the intention of this grant. This is supplemental grant to enhance your adult education programs. So that's, I hope that answered that question, but it's, if, if it is a cost for, if it is for information that relates to the alpha program, on this case, advertising the program, not the school, that would be allowable. And if it, if there are other programs like CTE that might not be part of AFLA, then it will be a cost allocation and AFLA can definitely pay for that proportion of the benefit received. Okay, thank you. Great, and our second question, would laptop carts be classified as furniture or equipment? Great question. So laptop carts, I would consider those as a, it's equipment, but it's under, if it is under 5,000, it will be allowable if it was, if it, you know, if it was a need for it, because it's really part of your laptop uh, uh, equipment or devices. So if it's under $5,000 per unit and it's used, it, it pass all those requirements, then that should be allowable, even though it's equipment, but again, Remember the equipment that is not allowable is with a per unit of $5,000 or more. One thing to keep in mind on equipment, a lot of the times the value is close to $5,000. Please keep in mind that equipment, the total of $5,000 on equipment includes uh, taxes. And if, if, if that device requires installation, deliverable, the uh, delivery cost, so, all that is included on the total cost. It's not just the the net cost. It's the total cost of the device, uh, taxes, delivery cost, and if it includes uh, installation cost. Great. Now that's it for our current uh, round of questions. Thank you. Great question. Thank you, Jim. Okay, time and effort reporting. This is by far the biggest area that we'll be covering today. And you'll see a lot of information, but at the end of the day, it's, I, I hope I provide the tools for you to uh, comply with this requirement. And time and effort reporting requirement, time and effort is only one of those items on the 56 select, uh, selected items of cost. So it's, is basically directly related to compensation for personal services. So there's a lot of requirements on this, and I suspect because this is the big, biggest biggest expense for adult education agencies, and typically can account up to 90% of the total grant. So bottom line is that if your agency use AFLA funds for compensations of personal services to pay salaries and benefits, then time and effort records are such as semi-annual certifications, personal activity reports, timesheet, whatever you use to document the time. So time and effort records are required. So what is required? The requirement said that any employee, full-time, part-time substitute hourly, pay with federal funds must maintain documentation showing that their time is allocable. Again, that allocability in proportion, allocable to a federal program. So in other words, a cost must be allocated or charged to a federal program in accordance to the benefits received. Again, this basic example, that if we, if, if an agency, if a teacher is paid 50% with AFLA funds, let's say resource code 3905, providing adult basic education, and 50% we CAPE, resource code 6391, the time and effort documentation, whether it's a semi-annual certification, personal activity report, timesheet, whatever the agency uses, must demonstrate that at least 50% of the time, of the teacher's time, 
was providing AFLA grant related activities under the resource code 3905. So allocability, the, the easy- Arturo, I'm gonna interrupt just for a second. Everybody's bells and whistles are gonna be going off right now because of the, uh, the alert. <laughs> So um, they're doing it across the United States. So we got it a little early here. Uh, you might have not have gotten it yet where you're at in California, but I'm um, just making sure that we have a little space here so that people can turn off the message and uh, and then get back to it, okay? Yeah, I just got the thing and acknowledge it and turn it off So There you go. When, let me know when we're ready to continue. I think we're good. Go. Let's go. Okay. I hope we're, we're all good now. And I, the only thing that I wanted to mention on allocation or lockability, really the, easy way, the easiest way to demonstrate that is to have the employees include on the, the time and effort, again, whether it's semi-annual, personal activity report or part, they they should clearly state the activity in the actual time on the actual time the employee is working benefiting the programs whether it's afla or the other resources the employee is compensated for and we'll cover some forms that have space to document the activity and the the time so in our coming slides we'll we'll have samples that will help us or hopefully help you understand the requirements better. Okay, this is the the standards for documentation for time and effort. The information is on three slides. This is the first one included on the on the standards for documentation that we mentioned on the prior slide. So again, whether you use a manual certification, parse timesheet. This is the requirement. So for this section of, of 2 CFR 200, 430I1, the documentation must be based on records that accurately reflect the work performed. The records must be supported by a system of internal controls which provide reasonable assurance that the charges are accurate, allowable, and properly allocated. So a, st a strong internal control ensure reliability and accuracy. For example, verifiable, document verifiable <laughs> documentation, such as review and approval of supervisors, signature for employees, having a uh, first-hand knowledge of the services the employee provide, backup documentation such as duty statements, class schedules, and so on. Again, I included note with leading questions, so hopefully this will help you when you go back and find if you're responsible for this area, then you can determine whether you have these systems in place or the requirements in place. But if not, we'll help you identify who or what or what unit is doing this work. The second requirement is that the records must be incorporated into the official records of the agency. So basically, on this case, uh, time and effort records should be incorporated with your payroll records and you time accounting records. This is the second slide of three that includes the standards for documentation. And so what the requirement is said is that the records must reasonably reflect the total activity for which the employee is compensated. So again, if the employee is funded with more than one funding source, the time and effort record must reflect 100% of the activity. We sometimes, uh, when we do our reviews, we see time and effort records uh, some agencies maintain, 
and the form has the elements, but it only includes the portion that relates to the federal award. So again, it must include 100%. Activities the employee perform under the, the AFLA, if they're the same as they do with CAPE, they will still have to display those from CAPE. If they are funded with all their funding sources, it has to include all 100% of the, of the activity. The second one, or the, the next one is that the records must in, encompass all activities, federal and non-federal. So basically these two requirements go hand in hand. And a, a, a leading question is, do the time and effort records include all activities, federal and non-federal, reflecting again, 100% of the position? And, and we'll, we'll look at some forms that will help us understand the requirement. This is the third slides that include the, the standards for documentation. And so it the requirement is that records must comply with the agency established accounting policies and practices. So in this case, does your time and effort records align with your policies and procedures? And we'll, we'll go over more policies and procedures, but in instance, what the what the policy and procedures say is what is taking place. The next one is or the, the next one is that the records must support the distribution among a specific activities or cost objectives. Cost objectives is definitely uh, something that we'll cover because it's, it's, it's important and we'll see more details on next slides. So Cost objective is the is mentioned here on the federal requirement, but pretty much what it is is cost objectives are the activities the employee perform. And again, the easiest way to have the employee describe or identify the cost objective is to include those or to identify or write those on the time and effort record. For example, a cost objective can be ESL instruction, AV instruction administration, professional development, CASAS intake, CASAS assessment. So all those are different cost objectives or activities. Another requirement is that budget estimates, these are estimates determined before the services are performed alone do not qualify as support for charges to federal awards. So this is one of the most common reasons for no comply of no compliance. A lot of the times we we receive documentation that reflects the funding and it's great uh, to see how the, the person is funded, but it does that doesn't that is not the time and effort. Remember the effort is the the effort that the employee uh, perform services to the program. So budget estimates, again, are not a valid evidence for, for, for time and effort documentation. So what will happen when we receive those documents, then we'll have to ask for more documentation. So what do the person do? Then we might interview the, the employee, then we'll request payroll records, uh, class schedules, and so that is just to justify the charges to the program. And the, the non-compliance still will be that the agency have to correct, uh, have a corrective action to, to train employees, to develop those policies and procedures, if not develop, that the time spent on the, on the program should be based, reasonably based on the actual time the employee spent serving those programs. And again, as mentioned, cost objective. This is uh, one of the standards of the documentation is that the records must support the distribution among specific activities or cost objectives. So on the regulation, a cost objective is defined as a function, activities, 
mandate, mandated set, set aside mandatory minimums, like for example, with AFLA, there is a requirement that you can spend up to 5% for administrative cost. So that will, that, that's what makes administrative cost a cost objective. I like the definition on the California school accounting menu. They, def they define in practical terms that a cost objective is a set of work, work activities allowable under the terms and conditions of a, part of a particular funding source. For example, on the resource code 3905, we have different cost objectives. We have ESL instruction, ABE instruction, CASA's testing, administrative costs. So again, this is resource code 3905, 39113, we have the high school uh, secondary education or high, um, high school diploma, GED instruction, high school instruction. So that's pretty much the cost objective are the, those activities of a particular funding source. Okay, when when administrators, again, with collaboration with your program and fiscal staff, you're, you're planning and determining or verifying what type of documentation this employee should maintain, the, something to keep in mind that a very, uh, the most significant factor is not the number of funding sources the employees pay is rather the activity or activities being performed by the employee. So if we go to what, when we wanna determine what type of documentation a certain employee should be maintaining, the type of documentation will depend on whether the employee works on a single cost objective or activity or multiple cost objectives. And again, um, the regulation, a single cost objective is a function, activity, and so on. Or when both the service is being performed and the population being served is allowable and eligible uh, under any of the program supporting the cost objective. And we have a couple examples that these are the typical ones on with the alpha funds. So a very basic one is when if we have an employee solely providing ESL instruction on the resource code 3905 and he's paid 100% with AFLA funds. That's a single cost objective or single activity. An example two, when employees pay with more than one funding source. So we have an employee who solely again provides ESL instruction. It's, Basically, the employee is doing the same function as on the example uh, one. But in this case, the employees pay 50% with AFLA and 50% with CAPE. So on this case, still the employee works on a single cost objective because the service is being performed and the population being served, English language learners, are allowable and eligible under CAPE and AFLA, supporting the ESL instruction cost objective of activity. So again, the factor is what the employee do compared to how is the employee being paid. And we have, uh, that leads us to a semi-annual certification or periodic certification, which is a form agencies often use to comply with the with the federal regulations for those employees who work on a single cost objective. So these are the elements that a semi annual certification will include to meet the federal requirements. It's an it's, it will be an after it will reflect an after the file record. This an after the file record covering the entire period of the certification identifies again the cost objective or activity, resource code, percentage of, of actual time, hours time, 
spend it for the period of the certification. Accounts for the total activity for which the employee is compensated. That, that, that means federal and non-federal. Any sign and dated by the employee or supervisor. Agencies might require to both signatures. That's a, a really good internal controls showing that the employee signed and the supervisor review and approve that time and effort documentation. Uh, there is a, sim a sample certification, semi-annual certification on the California School Accounting Manual. And this link will take you to that. But if not, it's on page 905, uh, 19. I'd like to mention that <clears throat> the semi-annual certification or periodic certification forms are suggestions. The, the agencies might use different certifications, but as long as he meets the federal requirements, we talk about on those four, the three slides and the, and the one prior to that. So again, if the agency use a different type of form of certification for employees who work on a single cost objective, make sure it includes these elements. And I hope you can see that this, you can probably increase your zoom on the PowerPoint, but this template or form is basic. And it's typically, again, for someone who works on a single cost objective or activity and is paid with only one funding source. If utilized correctly, this sample tem template includes all the elements and information the agency will need to help the agency meet the federal regulations. Again, for example, if you have an instructional A who works 100% supporting, let's say you adult secondary education, instruction, and is paid solely with resource code 3913, then these forms will be adequate. I'd like to mention something important. Employee training is very important, even with these simple forms, because the employee will need to understand that what they sign in is based on the on their position, and it, they are certain they certifying that they that's what they did. They provide adult secondary education instruction, and this is on this case a minor certification that is covering typically from July first to December thirty first and then is signed after December 31st, attesting or certifying that in fact, that's what they did during those six months. This is the, the template example to our second example on the slide, which is for someone who still work on a single cost objective, but is paid with more than one funding source. Again, if utilized correctly, this template includes the information to help the agency meet their requirements. Okay, uh, continuing with time type of documentation again, when you're making that determination, how do we, how, what the documentation these employees should maintain? And again, the type of documentation will depend on whether the employee works on a single cost objective or multiple cost objective. We have uh, the multiple cost objective is basically when an employee works on more than one federal work, a federal and non federal work, a function, and the activities performed are not considered a single cost objective. So, uh, two examples. On this case, we have an employee who is funded 25 with AFLA. Resource code 3926, 25 with Perkins. So that at that point, we know it's two different federal programs. So that employee works on a multiple cost object. So that employee will maintain the documentation the agency uses for individuals or for employees who work on a multiple cost objective. The sample, the sample two is if an employee provides offline instruction and administration services, which includes professional development, and is paid 100% with AFLA funds, 
the employee is considered to work on multiple cost objectives as instruction and administration activities are two separate functions or cost objectives within the AFLA grant. So even though it's 100% paid with AFLA, the employee works on two cost objectives. So the information should be maintained for each of those uh, activities. And again, still, and again, the most important factor is what the, the functions the employee do rather than the how they are paid. Parts of equivalent. So these are typically useful, the adequate for employees who work on multiple cost objectives, who usually have a vari variation of activities, support various programs, and we typically refer to this as a PAR, timesheet, or time log. And it, the elements for, for this uh, certification is that this is an after the fact record, again, as after the employee performed the, the activity, reflecting the actual time work, not budgeted estimates on each cost objective over activity under each resource code. Prepare at least monthly or unless substitute system includes all activities for which the employee is compensated 100% federal and non-federal. Again, signing date by the employee or supervisor. Agency might require both. This is a strong internal control again. And I'm also including a link to a sample form on the California School Accounting Menu. So that form is basic, but it's include the elements to meet the, the requirements, the federal requirements. Again, if the agency use any other type of documentation for employees who work on multiple cost objectives, uh, please ensure that includes at a minimum these elements. And most importantly, that they meet the requirements on the slides that we uh, discuss the standards. This is a sample form for those who work on multiple cost objectives and they, their time is fairly predictable. Again, training is, is, is important. So they, they understand that they need to document 100%. So on this case, this uh, will be adequate for someone who, like for example, a, a, a teacher who, who teaches uh, adult basic education and also teaches ESL or the literacy part on the resource code 3926. So 3926, 3905, they are different requirements for, for those funds. So they by itself are two different cost objectives. And if an employee is paid with 3926 and 3905 and CAPE and other, and other programs, then automatically is a, the employee is working on a multiple cost objective. Again, because the requirements for 3905, 3913 and 3926 are different. So it's different sources of funds with different eligibility. Uh, this is another form for employees who work on multiple cost objectives. And again, if utilized correctly, this form include the elements and information to help the agency meet the time and effort requirements for employees who work on multiple cost objectives. This form is pretty, is fairly simple. And I'll, I really like this form because it, it includes a clear area for funding source, activity, and the time the employee uh, spend serving that activity and that funding source. Again, these are just samples, but if you use any other form or certification, make sure you include the elements on these on these forms. And again, employee training is is very important because often we see the certifications 
but they not complete it correctly. Sometimes on the activity, they just, they just listed adult education, which is not very helpful because we don't know what they did on adult education. Sometimes it has just the resource code and not the activity, but again, with the resource code, we don't know what the activity was, so we cannot verify if the activity is allowable or not allowable. So employee training is very important that these forms are completed correctly and are reviewed and approved within reasonable time. Because uh, if the form is monthly, you should be signing and completing these forms right after the end of the, of the, of the month and it, it will it will have to show that it was reviewed and approved or it was signed some some type of assurance that is reasonably close to the month that is reported. Okay, real quick, the, the other part that is required for time and effort is policies and procedures. And so this, the, the federal cost allocation guide indicates that these are essential to implement an effective time and effort reporting system. Then the process should be in sufficient detail to understand how the systems will operate from when the time is work and when the time is recorded on the accounting records charged to the federal award. <clears throat> so some of the common non-compliance that we notice is that sometimes agencies don't have policy and procedures updated or non-existent. So if that is the case, definitely you will start as soon as you can and then reach out to your CD consultant if you need any assistance. An agency written policy and procedures are to be established and implemented for documented time and effort of employees that work on federal programs. These are the main, the, some of the elements that might in, be included on those policies and procedures. One key requirement or something really important is that the policies and procedures must include the elements to meet the federal compliance and also ensure that what's reflected on your policies and procedures is actually taking place. So your time and effort record should be aligned to your policies and procedures. If you say that you're maintaining personal activity reports, then you really maintaining personal activity reports. And they should include things such as what forms are they use, who must complete the forms, the due dates, where and when the forms are submitted, approval, reconciliation process, employee training, and sample forms in the appendix. So, when you have a review, this is one of the first areas that we review to understand your system. And so when we review the policy and procedures, expectation is that that's what's happening on, actually happening with your time and effort documentation. Okay, and uh, a couple of questions to help us understand the single versus multiple cost objective. On, on, this, case, on this question is we have a director of adult education who provides administrative services for AFLA and also we are Title I, Perkins. So on this case, once we see more than one federal award, one, one federal program automatically is that the person works on a multiple cost objective. single or multiple cost objective. Here we have an instructional A who provides instruction support for AVE students allowable under CAPE and AFLA. In addition, the A provides CASA's pre-test, post-test, and to these students. The A salary benefits and benefits are paid 60% with CAPE and 40% with AFLA resource code 3905. So in this case, the answer is A, this is a single cost objective based on that the service is being performed, AV instruction and CASA's pre-test, post-test, 
and the population being served, ABE students are allowable and eligible under CAPE and AFLA. So in this case, the employee will complete time and effort documentation the agency uses for employees who work on a single cost objective. And this is the last one. We have a school principal, principal who provides support to all adult education program. And again, the, we will need to know the functions of the services that the, the employee performs to make a determination. So in this case, uh, it will not be a sufficient information to determine a cost objective. We will need to know like what kind of support the principal does for this um, and what kind of programs support. Okay, <laughs> and that's it for time and effort. We're almost done. Uh, James, do we have questions for time and effort? Uh, yes, we, we have several, so I'll get okay. right to it. Okay. Um, first one, do you need time and effort reports for all adult ed staff, even if they are not paid with AFLA funds, or only those that are paid with AFLA funds? For example, the agency pays some of their teachers with AFLA, but not all. Okay, the, it's, it will be, the short answer is yes. And let me say for federal, for employees who are paid with AFLA funds, it's absolutely yes. For employees who are paid with restrictive funds, for example, CAPE is also yes. The agency should, should follow the federal rules for those uh, employees who are paid with restrictive programs. Uh, on the California School Accounting Manual, there is a, an alternative to use for those who uh, who are paid with restricted programs, but the the general rule is that they should be using the the um, the systems or the time and effort process that they use for federal. But if I'm not sure what the details are for for the those who are paid with K funds for the alternative, because there's, there's an alternative that they can use, but the expectation is that they use the federal re requirements. Great. And the next one, I think this question was asked before you provided examples of the PARs and the semi-annual certification, but it says, might you have a sample document to look at for time and effort? So the person who sent that question in, if what Arturo provided isn't what you're looking for, then uh, let us know. Thank you. And then um, is 50-50 allowable, even if prior to receiving WIOA grants, the teacher was paid 100% with CAPE. Okay, great question. So again, the, the employee, it really have to consider if there's a change on the activities. Like for example, if, they, if the employee was paid 100% with CAPE and it was just providing ESL, and now you wanna pay that employee with 50% CAPE, 50% AFLA, it has to be some change on the position. Like for example, now the teacher, instead of just doing ESL, the teacher is also providing tutoring services, is providing additional support to students that are not part of the same position. So it really depends on the services. Not so much, because what we use is, we use as a, as a first question is how this employee was paid on the prior year, but then, they, it might be different reasons. It might be because the employee got promoted because now the employee is teaching different subjects. So on this case, it's possible, but it will. the first consideration is what's difference from last year? Because when there's a budget shift, it has to be a difference. It has to be because there are additional uh, functions that are supplemental that might justify the, 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 the charge of the shift on, on funding. Great. And um, this person, I think, just had an example that they wanted a little clarity on. It says, uh, if if you have an IET teacher teaching part CTE and part ESL, they can only be funded in part by AFLA, correct? Yes, that is the, yeah, AFLA, they, they, and I'm going to assumed the IET, the CTEs for the resource code 3926. Again, they, those funds are intended for to support 
English language learners with the literacy and the work and the co-ops part. So on that case, definitely uh, the, the CTE part has to be paid ideally with non-AVLA. Title I usually can support the, the training piece. Okay, great. And then um, are CASAS testing and admin tasks considered different cost objectives? Yes. Uh, CASAS testing is direct services to everything that is direct to students. It's part of the 95% of the grant, which is the adult education and literacy activities. The administration is, is a different cost objective because there is that 5% that it needs, it needs to be identified. So that is the that is why it's two different cost objectives. Okay, great. And then we're just down to a few here. Are there any lists that state exactly what activity are cost objective terms to use? Uh, we don't really have a specific like a document that shows the cost objectives. But I uh, that's really interesting that maybe we will we'll put something in place. But in a way to think about cost objective is really the activities the employee perform. And the easiest way is to think on research code 3905 is ESL. So ESL includes instruction, administration, cost assessment testing, and data reporting. So data reporting, like for example, those uh, data managers, that's administrating the grant. So that is administration. CASAS testing, student intake, orientation, those are services directly to students. So that is not administration cost. Anything that doesn't have to do with administrating the grant is direct cost. And a cost objective, again, there's no right or wrong, but it should be sufficient to identify the activity the employee is doing. Okay. If reassigning an IA in a high school program who is paid by general funds to conducting an AFA, AFLA activity such as CASAS assessments, would it be allowable to switch to AFLA funds? Uh, I'm sorry, what is I, 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 I think what they're asking, I think what, if you have a uh, classified person um, uh, or a teacher, uh, it, it's an IA and there's, there's a lot of acronyms uh, in a high school program. So the person is, they they are being paid in general funds, mm -hmm. but then uh, I guess as part of their task, they're conducting an AFLA activity such as CASAS assessments. Mm -hmm. Would would that portion? I think what they're asking would that portion of their job be allowable to switch, or are to be covered by AFLA funds? Yeah, I, I think the key word there is reassigning, and again, yeah. it's, it's really not the person; it's what the person is doing. Again, if he was paid with CAPE, doing something related to K, but now it's gonna be reassigned to outflow activities. And if there is a need and they comply with the rules and regulation, that should be okay. Right, and our last one, would an instructor that helps with watching adults with kids be considered an AFLA supplement? Hmm. Uh, watching, um, will that so be- I, I, I think the students' kids. Um, uh, child for child, child care. care, yeah. Uh, I, I will. So basically, if he, if definitely that, that seems like a, that might be allowable because if I would say I, what I think is confusing or at least interesting is instructor watching kids or adults with kids. Uh, so for for child child care it's it might be because if they if to attend those avla programs they would not be able to pay with k funds for child care but with avla funds they're able to pay for child care costs whether it's instructor or someone who's going to watch that's definitely a supplemental a supplemental okay. cost that because it wouldn't be i guess the easiest way to put it it wouldn't be possible without the alpha funds. And that's the whole purpose to use alpha funds for those uh, type of services, support services. Okay, great. That's it for the questions. Okay. And again, we just have this, our 
this will go in a couple minutes. So this is the the matching requirement is that that the twenty five percent annual that all grantees must provide in non federal funds. And this is typically the those of you who are continuing. So on the next slide, I'm going to show you an example. These are reported on the ECR. Again, the, the non federal funds contribution can be on cash, in kind, or uh, stay in local uh, stay in local funds. So I just want to mention a key requirement on the matching contribution is that they they are subject to the same rules and regulations the AFLA funds are subject. So it has to be allowable under the grant in, in order to be for the agency to claim or to report as a matching contribution. So this is the I, agency reported the the um, non-federal contribution on on the uh, expenditure crime report. This is an example of what new grantees will see. And it's just divided on three, three sections. The state general fund is typically UK expenditures related to AFLA activities. The, the other non-federal funding, that is very rare. I mean, it's not often that we see those and mainly because the contribution really are uh, th things such as cash or designated foundation, local grants assigned for APLA programs or for literacy programs. In-kind funding is the other op uh, the other section and in-kind funding is, is, is typical. Is, that is your classroom space, volunteering time, buildings, donated property, and so on. And that's it. If there is any questions on matching, Jim? Uh, so far, nothing's appearing, but we can give folks maybe a second or two, but it's, yeah, uh, yeah I, I guess you covered everything for that <laughs> section. So, great. Okay. okay, and if there are no questions right on time, thank you so much again for attending. And we know this can be complex, but again, uh, keep this PowerPoint, uh, reach out to, to your CD consultant, reach out to me if there's anything we can assist. And if you have additional questions, you can send those to, to me or to your consultant or to the CDE Adult Education Office. So the information is on the slide. And again, I want to thank you one last time.